Preliminary Expectoration by Soren Kierkegaard From Fear and Trembling Published in 1843 Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org as far as i am concerned i am able to describe most excellently the movements of faith but i cannot make them myself when a person wishes to learn how to swim he has himself suspended in a swimming belt and then goes through the motions but that does not mean that he can swim in the same fashion i too can go through the motions of faith but when i am thrown into the water i swim to be sure for i am not a waiter in the shallows but i go through a different set of movements to wit those of infinity whereas faith does the opposite to wit makes the movements to regain the finite after having made those of infinite resignation blessed is he who can make these movements for he performs a marvellous feat and i shall never weary of admiring him whether now it be abraham himself or the slave in abraham's house whether it be a professor of philosophy or a poor servant girl it is all the same for me for i have regard only to the movements but these movements i watch closely and i will not be deceived whether by myself or by any one else the knights of infinite resignation are easily recognized for their gait is dancing and bold but they who possess the jewel of faith frequently deceive one because their bearing is curiously like that of a class of people heartily despised by infinite resignation as well as by faith the philistines let me admit frankly that i have not in my experience encountered any certain specimen of this type but i do not refuse to admit that as far as i know every other person may be such a specimen at the same time i will say that i have searched vainly for years it is the custom of scientists to travel around the globe to see rivers and mountains new stars gay-colored birds misshapen fish ridiculous races of men they abandon themselves to a bovine stupor which gapes at existence and believe that they have seen something worth while all this does not interest me but if i knew where there lived such a knight of faith i would journey to him on foot for that marvel occupies my thoughts exclusively not a moment would i leave him out of sight but would watch how he makes the movement and i would consider myself provided for life and would divide my time between watching him and myself practicing the movement and would thus use all my time in admiring him as i said i have not met with such a one but i can easily imagine him here he is i make his acquaintance and am introduced to him the first moment i lay my eyes on him i push him back leaping back myself i hold up my hands in amazement and say to myself good lord that person is it really he why he looks like a parish beetle but it is really he i become more closely acquainted with him watching his every movement to see whether some trifling incongruous movement of his has escaped me some trace perchance of a signalling from the infinite a glance a look a gesture a melancholy air or a smile which might betray the presence of infinite resignation contrasting with the finite but no i examine his figure from top to toe to discover whether there be anywhere a chink through which the infinite might be seen to peer forth but no he is of a piece all through and how about his footing vigorous altogether that of finiteness no citizen dressed in his very best prepared to spend his sunday afternoon in the park treads the ground more firmly he belongs altogether to this world no philistine more so 
there is no trace of the somewhat exclusive and haughty demeanor which marks off the knight of infinite resignation he takes pleasure in all things is interested in everything and perseveres in whatever he does with the zest characteristic of persons wholly given to worldly things he attends to his business and when one sees him one might think he was a clerk who had lost his soul in doing double bookkeeping he is so exact he takes a day off on sunday he goes to church but no hint of anything supernatural or any other sign of the incommensurable betrays him and if one did not know him it would be impossible to distinguish him in the congregation for his brisk and manly singing proves only that he has a pair of good lungs in the afternoon he walks out to the forest he takes delight in all he sees in the crowds of men and women the new omnibuses the sound if one met him on the promenade one might think he was some shopkeeper who was having a good time so simple is his joy for he is not a poet and in vain have i tried to lure him into betraying some sign of the poet's detachment toward evening he walks home again with a gait as steady as that of a mail carrier on his way he happens to wonder whether his wife will have some little special warm dish ready for him when he comes home as she surely has as for instance a roasted lamb's head garnished with greens and if he met one minded like himself he is very likely to continue talking about this dish with him till they reach the east gate and to talk about it with a zest befitting a chef as it happens he has not four shillings to spare and yet he firmly believes that his wife surely has that dish ready for him if she has it would be an enviable sight for distinguished people and an inspiring one for common folks to see him eat for he has an appetite greater than esau's his wife has not prepared it strange he remains altogether the same again on his way he passes a building lot and there meets another man they fall to talking and in a trice he erects a building freely disposing of everything necessary and the stranger will leave him with the impression that he has been talking with a capitalist the fact being that the night of my admiration is busy with the thought that if it really came to the point he would unquestionably have the means wherewithal at his disposal now he is lying on his elbows in the window and looking over the square on which he lives all that happens there if it be only a rat creeping in a gutter hole or children playing together everything engages his attention and yet his mind is at rest as though it were the mind of a girl of sixteen he smokes his pipe in the evening and to look at him you would swear it was the green grocer from across the street who is lounging at the window in the evening twilight thus he shows as much unconcern as any worthless happy-go-lucky fellow and yet at every moment he lives he purchases his leisure at the highest price for he makes not the least movement except by virtue of the absurd and yet yet indeed i might become furious with anger if for no other reason than that of envy and yet this man has performed and is performing every moment the movement of infinity he has resigned everything absolutely and then again seized hold of it all on the strength of the absurd but this miracle may so easily deceive one that it will be best if i describe the movements in a given case which may illustrate their aspect in contact with reality and that is the important point suppose then a young swain falls in love with a princess and all his life is bound up with this love but circumstances are such that it is out of the question to think of marrying her an impossibility to translate his dreams into reality 
the slaves of poultriness the frogs in the sloughs of life they will shout of course such a love is folly the rich brewer's widow is quite as good and solid a match let them but croak the knight of infinite resignation does not follow their advice he does not surrender his love not for all the riches of the world he is no fool he first makes sure that this love really is the contents of his life for his soul is too sound and too proud to waste itself on a mere intoxication he is no coward he is not afraid to let his love insinuate itself into his most secret and most remote thoughts to let it wind itself in innumerable coils about every fibre of his consciousness if he is disappointed in his love he will never be able to extricate himself again he feels a delicious pleasure in letting love thrill his every nerve and yet his soul is solemn as is that of him who has drained a cup of poison and who now feels the virus mingle with every drop of his blood poised in that moment between life and death having thus imbibed love and being wholly absorbed in it he does not lack the courage to try and dare all he surveys the whole situation he calls together his swift thoughts which like tame pigeons obey his every beck he gives the signal and they dart in all directions but when they return every one bearing a message of sorrow and explain to him that it is impossible then he becomes silent he dismisses them he remains alone and then he makes the movement now if what i say here is to have any significance it is of prime importance that the movement be made in a normal fashion the night of resignation is supposed to have sufficient energy to concentrate the entire contents of his life and the realization of existing conditions into one single wish but if one lacks this concentration this devotion to a single thought if his soul from the very beginning is scattered on a number of objects he will never be able to make the movement he will be as worldly wise in the conduct of his life as a financier who invests his capital in a number of securities to win on the one if he should lose on the other that is he is no knight furthermore the knight is supposed to possess sufficient energy to concentrate all his thought into a single act of consciousness if he lacks this concentration he will only run errands in life and will never be able to assume the attitude of infinite resignation for the very minute he approaches it he will suddenly discover that he forgot something so that he must remain behind the next minute thinks he it will be attainable again and so it is but such inhibitions will never allow him to make the movement but will rather tend to let him sink even deeper into the mire our knight then performs the movement which movement is he intent on forgetting the whole affair which too would presuppose much concentration no for the knight does not contradict himself and it is a contradiction to forget the main contents of one's life and still remain the same person and he has no desire to become another person neither does he consider such a desire to smack of greatness only lower natures forget themselves and become something different thus the butterfly has forgotten that it once was a caterpillar who knows but it may forget altogether that it was once a butterfly and turn into a fish deeper natures never forget themselves and never change their essential qualities so the knight remembers all but precisely this remembrance is painful nevertheless in his infinite resignation he has become reconciled with existence his love for the princess has become for him the expression of an eternal love 
has assumed a religious character has been transfigured into a love for the eternal being which to be sure denied him the fulfilment of his love yet reconciled him again by presenting him with the abiding consciousness of his love's being preserved in an everlasting form of which no reality can rob him now he is no longer interested in what the princess may do and precisely this proves that he has made the movement of infinite resignation correctly in fact this is a good criterion for detecting whether a person's movement is sincere or just make-believe take a person who believes that he too has resigned but lo time passed the princess did something on her part for example married a prince and then his soul lost the elasticity of its resignation this ought to show him that he did not make the movement correctly for he who has resigned absolutely is sufficient unto himself the knight does not cancel his resignation but preserves his love as fresh and young as it was at the first moment he never lets go of it just because his resignation is absolute whatever the princess does cannot disturb him for it is only the lower natures who have the law for their actions in some other person for example have the premises of their actions outside of themselves infinite resignation is the last stage which goes before faith so that every one who has not made the movement of infinite resignation cannot have faith for only through absolute resignation do i become conscious of my eternal worth and only then can there arise the problem of again grasping hold of this world by virtue of faith we will now suppose the knight of faith in the same case he does precisely as the other knight he absolutely resigns the love which is the contents of his life he is reconciled to the pain but then the miraculous happens he makes one more movement strange beyond comparison saying and still i believe that i shall marry her marry her by virtue of the absurd by virtue of the fact that to god nothing is impossible now the absurd is not one of the categories which belong to the understanding proper it is not identical with the improbable the unforeseen the unexpected the very moment our knight resigned himself he made sure of the absolute impossibility in any human sense of his love this was the result reached by his reflections and he had sufficient energy to make them in a transcendent sense however by his very resignation the attainment of his end is not impossible but this very act of again taking possession of his love is at the same time a relinquishment of it nevertheless this kind of possession is by no means an absurdity to the intellect for the intellect all the while continues to be right as it is aware that in the world of finalities in which reason rules his love was and is an impossibility the knight of faith realizes this fully as well hence the only thing which can save him is recourse to the absurd and this recourse he has through his faith that is he clearly recognizes the impossibility and in the same moment he believes the absurd for if he imagined he had faith without at the same time recognizing with all the passion his soul is capable of that his love is impossible he would be merely deceiving himself and his testimony would be of no value since he had not arrived even at the stage of absolute resignation this last movement the paradoxical movement of faith i cannot make whether or no it be my duty although i desire nothing more ardently than to be able to make it 
it must be left to a person's discretion whether he cares to make this confession and at any rate it is a matter between him and the eternal being who is the object of his faith whether an amicable adjustment can be effected but what every person can do is to make the movement of absolute resignation and i for my part would not hesitate to declare him a coward who imagines he cannot perform it it is a different matter with faith but what no person has a right to is to delude others in the belief that faith is something of no great significance or that it is an easy matter whereas it is the greatest and the most difficult of all things but the story of abraham is generally interpreted in a different way god's mercy is praised which restored isaac to him it was but a trial a trial this word may mean much or little and yet the whole of it passes off as quickly as the story is told one mounts a winged horse in the same instant one arrives on mount moriah and presto one sees the ram it is not remembered that abraham only rode on an ass which travels but slowly that it was a three days journey for him and that he required some additional time to collect the firewood to bind isaac and to wet his knife and yet one extols abraham he who is to preach the sermon may sleep comfortably until a quarter of an hour before he is to preach and the listener may comfortably sleep during the sermon for everything is made easy enough without much exertion either to preacher or listener but now suppose a man was present who suffered with sleeplessness and who went home and sat in a corner and reflected as follows the whole lasted but a minute you need only wait a little while and then the ram will be shown and the trial will be over now if the preacher should find him in this frame of mind i believe he would confront him in all his dignity and say to him wretched that thou art to let thy soul lapse into such folly miracles do not happen all life is a trial and as he proceeded he would grow more and more passionate and would become ever more satisfied with himself and whereas he had not noticed any congestion in his head while preaching about abraham he now feels the veins on his forehead swell yet who knows but he would stand aghast if the sinner should answer him in a quiet and dignified manner that it was precisely this about what he preached the sunday before let us then either waive the whole story of abraham or else learn to stand in awe of the enormous paradox which constitutes his significance for us so that we may learn to understand that our age like every age may rejoice if it has faith if the story of abraham is not a mere nothing an illusion or if it is just used for show and as a pastime the mistake cannot by any means be in the sinner's wishing to do likewise but it is necessary to find out how great was the deed which abraham performed in order that the man may judge for himself whether he has the courage and the mission to do likewise the comical contradiction in the procedure of the preacher was his reduction of the story of abraham to insignificance whereas he rebuked the other man for doing the very same thing but should we then cease to speak about abraham i certainly think not but if i were to speak about him i would first of all describe the terrors of his trial to that end leech-like i would suck all the suffering and distress out of the anguish of a father in order to be able to describe what abraham suffered whilst yet preserving his faith i would remind the hearer that the journey lasted three days and a goodly part of the fourth 
in fact these three and a half days ought to become infinitely longer than the few thousand years which separate me from abraham i would remind him as i think right that every person is still permitted to turn about before trying his strength on the formidable task in fact that he may return every instant in repentance provided this is done i fear for nothing nor do i fear to awaken great desires among people to attempt to emulate abraham but to get out a cheap edition of abraham and yet forbid every one to do as he did that i call ridiculous End of Preliminary Expectoration Part 2 by Soren Kierkegaard From Fear and Trembling Published in 1843 Translated by Lee M. Hollander